Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. I've done a few videos about weird art in the past, but I tend to stick to the canvas, so to speak, looking at paintings, drawings, you know, proper art. But if you wanted to find the truly bizarre stuff, then the world of performance art is a good place to start. There are some artists that take this stuff to a whole other level. Ones that endanger their own physical and mental health, as well as sometimes that of the audience, all in the name of creating a work of art. So let's take a look at the world of extreme performance artists. We'll start off with Wafa Bilal, the artist that gave himself PTSD. Born in Iraq in 1966, his formative years were shaped by a backdrop of war and political turmoil. As an adult, Bilal created artwork that criticised Saddam's regime, and for this he was arrested as a dissident and tortured. In 1992 he moved to America, and he now teaches art at New York's Tisch School of the Arts. So as you can imagine, this brutal early start in life led to him creating some pretty extreme artworks. In 2010 he had a metal plate attached to the back of his head. It was fixed in place by three metal pins that were surgically implanted beneath his scalp by a body modification artist. The metal plate had a camera attached to it which took a photograph every 10 seconds. and This was broadcast to a website which also gave his location via a GPS tracker. The idea was to have the camera broadcasting these images for a whole year, but after three months, Wafa Bilal was in constant pain and his body started to reject the implants. He continued the project with the camera tied to his head and he had the infected part of the implant removed. But his most extreme work, at least in my opinion, is his 2007 piece titled Domestic Tension. He set himself up in a small living space in the Flat File Gallery in Chicago. It had a bed, a computer, an exercise bike, and a small lamp. It also, more importantly, had a webcam broadcasting a live feed to his website 24 hours a day, and a turret-mounted paintball gun which viewers could operate via his website. Wafa Bilal remained in this space, being bombarded with paintballs at all hours of the day. The work recreated the sensation of being in a war zone, the constant threat of being shot, the endless thudding sound of the paintball gun. It also explored the idea of hyper-reality, the disassociation between the internet user shooting someone on their computer screen and the reality of a human being shot in real life. This was at a time when unmanned western drones were dropping bombs on Iraqi villages, piloted by someone sat safely at a computer far away from the war zone. What started out as a completely white gallery space quickly got covered with a sticky yellow paint. What these images don't get across is the smell. The paintballs contained fish oil, as well as everything getting covered in this greasy yellow mess. It also stank. Moving around the room, even if you weren't being shot at, became an extremely unpleasant experience. By the tenth day, the paint on the floor got so thick that it started seeping through an air vent into a storeroom below which contained paintings. Wafa Bilal had to cover this vent with a towel which prevented fresh air from entering the room, creating a stifling atmosphere. This stifling, stinking air, combined with the sound of the gun firing and the tension of not knowing when it would fire next, made sleep almost impossible. The website was set up so that there would be a cooldown between gunshots, but on the 16th day, hackers found a way of overriding this cooldown and began shooting him with rapid fire like a machine gun. Bilal started to develop PTSD-like symptoms, insomnia and nightmares if he did manage to sleep, difficulty breathing, tightness in the chest and stomach pains. For 31 days he remained in this room, only exiting to use the toilet or take a shower. On the final day he says he felt like a completely different person, like he'd spent a year in there rather than just a month. He wrote a book about the experience called Shoot an Iraqi, it's worth a read. You get a sense that the messages he got in the chat room from the people operating the gun affected him as much as the paintballs themselves. I mean, if you set up a gun and invite people to shoot you with it, 
you can't really be surprised if you attract some pretty hostile people but I think it was the constant slew of abuse combined with the fact that these people were deliberately trying to hurt him. It created a weird psychological factor that really seems to have got under his skin. Another artist that deliberately confined himself in an unbearable situation was Chris Burden. In 1971, for his fine art master's thesis at UC Irvine, he performed the Five Day Locker Piece. The students at UC Irvine had each been given an empty classroom in which to exhibit their final art project. Chris Burden visited his own allocated room several times trying to figure out how he was going to exhibit his work, but instead he became interested in a row of lockers in the corridor outside his room. In the week before his performance was to begin, Burden mailed out invites to his art professors and fellow students, inviting them to his final project at room 167, locker 5. Then at 8am on Monday the 26th of April, he climbed into locker 5, a space that was 2 foot in width and diameter and 3 feet deep. His wife then padlocked the door shut from the outside. The space was just big enough for Burden to sit hunched over or lie in a fetal position. There was no way at all for him to straighten out. In the locker above him there was a 5 gallon water container which he could drink through a tube. Another tube connected to an empty 5 gallon container in the locker below him. This was for collecting his urine. Burden had starved himself for several days leading up to the performance so that he wouldn't need to pass solids whilst he was in there. He remained in this space until 5pm on Friday the 30th of April, five days after he'd entered. There's not many pictures of the piece, mostly because it'd just be a picture of the outside of a locker. This photo shows Burden's wife feeding him fruit juice through the slats in the locker's door and it gives you an idea of just how small the space was. A few days into his confinement, Burden started to experience severe cramps in his legs and he was given muscle relaxants. Doctors also raised concerns about the risk of blood clots forming from lying in the same position for such an extended period of time. Towards the end of the performance, the psychological toll of his confinement manifested in a terrible fear about his own vulnerability. As word of his performance spread, random people would come to the locker throughout the day and stand outside it talking to him. Burden became fixated on the idea that one of these people might try to hurt him and there would be nothing he could do to stop them. Luckily, the performance passed without incidents and he emerged from the locker unscathed, having solidified his name in the art world through an act of extreme human endurance. And this wasn't his only extreme performance piece. Later that same year, he would have someone shoot him in the arm with a rifle for a performance titled Shoot. In 1973, he did a performance called 747, which involved him firing a pistol at a Boeing 747 full of passengers as it took off from the LA International Airport. In 1976, he performed a piece called Do You Believe in Television? It involved taking a bunch of people into an underground multi-story car park, then setting a fire on the lowest level whilst they watched it on a monitor. The performance only ended when the audience members managed to put out the fire. And this kind of messed up audience participation brings me on to our next artist, Mao Sugiyama. And we're now getting into the part of the video where I really can't show much of the performances themselves, at least not if you're watching on YouTube. Even so, the descriptions are pretty graphic from here on out. Now, I'm not one for giving out content warnings, but I'm just saying, if you're eating your dinner right now, consider yourself warned. In 2012, Mao Sugiyama, an asexual Japanese artist, decided he was going to have his genitals removed. I mean, I guess if you don't need them. Leading up to his surgery, he went on a month-long sex binge just to make sure he was making the right decision. This sex binge didn't change his mind and so, shortly after his 22nd birthday, he had his penis and testicles surgically removed. He kept his severed genitalia in his freezer whilst he decided what he wanted to do with them. He knew he wanted to turn his castration into some sort of spectacle, a work of performance art. 
At first he had the idea that he was going to cook and eat it, but then he had a better idea. Why not invite other people to eat it and then you can charge them for the meal? And so he sent out the following tweets. I am offering my male genitals, full penis, testes, scrotum as a meal for 100,000 yen. I am Japanese. The organs were surgically removed at age 22. I was tested to be free of venereal diseases. The organs were of normal function. I was not receiving female hormone treatment. First interested buyer will get them, or I will also consider selling to a group. Will prepare and cook as the buyer requests at his chosen location. If you have questions, please contact me by DM or email. He got such an overwhelming response that instead of cooking the meal for just one person, he decided to hold a banquet and divvy up his dismembered member among multiple guests. The event was held on the 13th of April at the Asagaya Loft A event space. There were around 70 guests, but only 6 people had opted for the cock and balls banquet, each of them paying the equivalent of around $250 to do so. The other guests were served a meal of beef or crocodile meat. The guests had to sign a waiver to say they wouldn't hold him responsible if they got sick. The meal was cooked up by Sugiyama himself from a portable gas stove. His genitals were thinly sliced and fried up with button mushrooms and parsley. The pictures of the meal just look like random bits of meat really, but just to be on the safe side I'm going to blur them out for YouTube. I can describe them for you though. This one looks to be a bit of fried scrotal skin. Now if you've ever had a pork scratching where they didn't quite shave all the hair off and it's still got that stubble on it. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently though it was a pretty bad meal. The meat turned out tough and rubbery. I actually watched a documentary where they interviewed the cannibal killer Armin Muse and he said the same thing about penis meat being really hard to chew. When will cannibals learn to slow cook? So anyway, after Sugiyama's banquet there was a bit of a media frenzy with people demanding that he be arrested. However, in Japan there's no laws against cannibalism so police couldn't really do anything about it. Instead they tried to get him on an indecent exposure charge. After all, he had exposed his privates to people, even if they weren't attached to his body at the time. It seems though there wasn't much of a case against him. All the guests were at the banquet willingly and they all knew what they were getting into, so the indecent exposure charge didn't really stick. Another artist that cooked up a revolting meal was the Chinese artist Zhu Yu. If you ever frequented any of these shock sites back in the day, you've probably come across these pictures before. In 2000, Zhu Yu performed a piece titled Eating People. For this performance, Zhu Yu was photographed in his kitchen, cooking and then eating what looks to be a human fetus. He said that no religion forbids cannibalism, nor can I find any law which prevents us from eating people. I took advantage of the space between morality and law and based my work on it. I herewith announce my intention and my aim to eat people as a protest against mankind's moral idea that he or she cannot eat people. In later interviews he said that he vomited several times whilst attempting to eat the fetus. The photograph of Zhu Yu's bizarre feast was supposed to appear at the Fuck Off exhibition in Shanghai, but were pulled at the last minute when China's Ministry of Culture announced a ban on art exhibits involving corpses, animal abuse and violence. The pictures found their way online, and they're usually posted without context or they're falsely attributed to some news story about restaurants selling food made from human fetuses. There's a lot of speculation as to whether Zhu Yu really did eat a fetus or not. The images appear on a lot of fact checking sites with the false or misleading caption, but these sites are debunking the false news stories that use these photos in a misleading way. They're not debunking the actual photographs. In a couple of their articles, Snopes does suggest that the fetus might actually be a duck carcass with a doll's head attached, but they don't provide any source for this assertion and they don't state it as fact. It seems to be more of a suggestion than anything else. In the documentary Beijing Swings, they interview Zhu Yu. At the end of the clip that's uploaded to YouTube, a disclaimer comes up that says Zhu Yu has recently come out to reveal that it was all faked. 
He doesn't admit it's fake in any of the interviews that they showed, so he must have said it off camera. It could have just been put in there at the last minute to avoid censorship or criminal charges, or it could be true and he really did fake it. However, we know that Zhu Yu isn't squeamish about using real human remains in his artwork, even cooking with them. In 1998, he boiled up five human brains and displayed them in jars for the It's All Right exhibition. In 1999, he suspended a decaying human arm from the ceiling of an exhibition space. Whether or not this means he would go as far as eating a fetus, I'm not sure, but it seems it's a matter of debate that hasn't quite been settled yet. Two more Chinese performance artists that incorporated human remains into their work are Sun Yuan and Peng Yu. I'm probably saying those names wrong. In 2000, there was a private exhibition called Indulge in Hurt. It was held at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. Sun Yuan and Peng Yu did two performances at this exhibition, both of them involving dead infant specimens taken from a hospital's anatomy room. In the performance titled Feeding Human Oil to a Human Being, Peng Yu fed oil rendered from human fat through a tube into the mouth of a baby's corpse. Their most disturbing piece was called Linked Bodies. For this performance the artists sat in chairs and they had their blood drawn through tubes which fed into the mouths of dead conjoined twins placed on the floor in front of them. This futile blood transfusion quickly filled the mouths of the dead twins. It poured outwards and down the baby's torsos. The artists argued that the use of medical samples in art should be seen as as valid as using them in medical research or education. They say their work was designed to break the bonds of social taboos to enable the viewer to see the conceptual world beyond its material existence. So finally, let's look at the Russian artist and activist Petr Pavlensky. Mostly it's because I wanted to use this picture in the thumbnail. The image was taken during his carcass performance in May of 2013. In order to protest the increasingly authoritarian rules designed to suppress and intimidate the population, Pavlensky lay naked and wrapped in a cocoon of barbed wire outside the Legislative Assembly of St. Petersburg. He said, these laws, like the wire, keep people in individual pens. All of this persecution of political activists, governmental repressions, is the metaphor of the pen with the barbed wire around it. All of this has been done in order to turn people into gutless and securely guarded cattle, which can only consume, work and reproduce. He lay in his barbed wire cage, motionless and refusing to respond to anyone around him until the police came and cut him out with wire cutters. He was carted off and given a psychiatric evaluation and then he was briefly imprisoned. Six months later, Pavlensky would perform his most notorious piece called Fixation. He went to Red Square in Moscow, he stripped naked and he sat down on the cobblestone pavement in front of Lenin's mausoleum. He then took a hammer and a long metal nail and nailed his scrotum to the pavement. Pavlensky got the idea for this performance during his imprisonment after the carcass protest. Another prisoner had told him tales about the gulags and how prisoners had nailed their scrotums to trees to protest the inhuman conditions they were suffering. The fixation performance, he said, was a metaphor of the apathy, political indifference and fatalism of Russian society. He timed it to coincide with a national holiday called Police and Internal Affairs Servicemen's Day to cause maximum disruption. The police, finding what they thought was just a naked man sat on the floor, tried to move him but when they found that his balls were nailed to the floor, they threw a blanket over him until the nail could be safely removed. After that, he was taken to hospital. Sitting naked and nailing your nuts to the floor in the middle of a Russian police parade, now that's the way to protest. I don't know where the line is between art and someone fulfilling their own weird fetishes. <laughs> I suspect some of this art might straddle that line, but I hope you found this video informative, maybe it's even inspired you. 
Uh, it's good to get back to covering weird arts. It's a subject I find really interesting. People are always asking me to do more videos like this, so hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to everyone who's helping to keep the channel going. I do blur out some of my YouTube videos just to make sure it doesn't get outright banned, but I'm not sure if it'll be monetizable. So having a Patreon means I don't have to worry so much about that sort of thing. So thank you to all these people, it is much appreciated. If you like this video, I've got a few more videos about art. There's an old one about art made by people with mental illnesses, and it's from back in the day when I used to pitch my voice right down because I thought it sounded more spooky and foreboding, so you'll have to deal with that cringe if you watch it, but you might enjoy it anyway. I'll put it on screen now if you want to check it out. So, thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.